Welcome to the second day here in Dublin. Um, I'm glad to see the hall is kind of full. This auditorium was designed for 2,000 people. We're nearly 1,000, so it kind of looks half full. That's good. I take it the first day was very well received. At least the feedback I got was very well received. Um, I hear people were are ecstatic about meeting in person again, and I must say that the same is true for me. I'm really happy to s kind of see people in person again. It started feeling like a strange dream where you see people in squared boxes, maybe, and uh, so really happy to hear. I'm also told that people really appreciated the training session yesterday that uh, Mick and Roman gave. This is really cool, and there is something I'd like to ask you. If you enjoy trainings, and if you enjoy giving trainings, speak out to us. We are really looking for people that volunteer, giving training sessions, giving training courses on something you're passionate about. First, we'll support you with this. We will reimburse you with all the expenses. If this is something you'd be interested, even if you have never done it, talk to us. We'll try to support you. Send an email to either FirstSec at first.org or talk to me or any of the other board members. Um, now, there's one thing I've been told to make a, for a public announcement, and if you look at these notebooks and you look at the last page, and I've never seen this personally, it says ingredients pine nuts. So depending on where you fly, you actually have to tick the box, I bring food in, because the booklet contains pine seeds. Uh, and I guess if you want to avoid a conversation with an overly dutiful customs or border guard, then maybe you tick this if it's appropriate. Other than that, there's uh, really not much for me to say except to welcome Ganesh, one of our Platinum sponsors. And maybe let me thank all the sponsors again because thanks to people like Ganesh and Optics, we can actually make this conference happening. So without further ado, Danish Pipe. Optics is the tool of choice for modern defenders, offering advanced detection of attacks and helping create a strong defensive posture to neutralize them. The platform gathers high fidelity signals from an array of telemetry sources across your entire attack surface, including all endpoints, cloud workloads, and cloud infrastructure. With a powerful streaming analytics engine and data pipeline, you gain access to a wealth of structured security data in real time. Data summarizations and visualizations offer easy to understand insights and measurable security performance metrics. Plus, with no black box detections, easily find the answers you need for detections and remediation, investigations, compliance, and more. Uptix helps modern defenders speed time to detection, conduct better investigations, and deliver better security outcomes, which can translate into better ROI from your security program. Sign up for your live demo now and see Uptix in action. Hi, everyone. I'm Ganesh Pai. I'm founder and CEO of Uptix. Uh, my background, I'm an engineer by training, a technologist by uh, vocation and an entrepreneur by choice, but more importantly, I love uh, incident response and I love the organization. And many of you out here uh, inspired me in more ways than one. Uh, first, no pun intended, I appreciate the opportunity presented to us by the first organization to participate here in uh, Dublin. Uh, we've been participating uh, arguably for the last Five years, possibly we could, out of uh, the six years of existence of Uptex. Uh, 2018 in Malaysia, 2019 in Edinburgh, and now uh, hopefully in a significant way in uh, Dublin. Uh, the ethos of this organization, and especially uh, that of uh, incident responders, and what you stand for is very near and dear to Uptex. So go first. A little bit about Uptex. Um, before I get started, as exciting as the video might have been, I'd like to share something and outline. Here's a jersey which our team has put together. This is a limited edition uh, 
first uh, jersey. There are only two out of this. Of course, there are a lot more uh, soccer jerseys available at uh, our booth. Feel free to stop by and say hi, and we'd be happy to hook you up. But the reason I picked this specific one is that this is one out of two, and you might appreciate it uh, given the fact that we've not had an opportunity to meet for the last two years uh, thanks to COVID. Uh, a little bit about us, we are a Boston-based uh, cybersecurity venture. Uh, we provide uh, coverage for two asset categories, endpoint detection and response, and the second one is cloud infrastructure security. Yes, if Gartner has an acronym soup which begins with the alphabet C for cloud, Uptix provides something meaningful for that. Uh, more importantly, as a venture, what we specialize is in an area where software is eating the world. Uh, we provide visibility in the software's journey all the way from the laptop to the cloud. Uh, next to the reason, why are we here and why are we participating in this conference? Uh, we strongly feel about our mission to empower the human intelligence, especially to the people who are attending this conference, especially the analysts who are responsible for detection and incident response. Um, what differentiates us is our ability to unearth what uh, lies beneath. Uh, most vendors, probably including us, are quite adept at detections, but what specializes the people who attend this conference is your skill which allows you to do threat hunting and figure out things using human intelligence. Uh, we, of course, provide you the tooling to uh, reduce your dwell time. But one thing that I'll also bring up is that, as many of you probably speak good English, we speak uh, Yara as fluently as that. So given that the majority of you might be uh, involved in threat hunting, we operationalize uh, threat hunting at scale, especially using the Yara language. Um, please visit us at our booth so that we can share our customer anecdotes give us perspective on what our engagement with uh, organizations and users like yourself has been. Um, without further ado, next I'd like to introduce the keynote speaker. My job is to just introduce the next person whom I'm sure you're all waiting for. Uh, she's an accomplished industry analyst and a security practitioner. Please welcome Wendy Nather. It's vodka time. Did anybody tell you that? Who's with me? Mm. All right. Given what's happened over the last few years and how we've discovered, we've had a, a forced lesson in how to come together as, as a planet, not just as a society, I thought it would be time to take a step forward and ask what we owe one another in the cybersecurity ecosystem. Not just what we can do, because we've been talking about that for a long, long time. Not what would be nice, but what do we owe one another? I think kumbaya time is over. I think it's time for us to step forward as responsible adults and talk about what we actually owe one another. Because today, businesses are computing as ecosystems. They're no longer just little silos, or as I like to call them, cylinders of excellence. They are, they are cooperating with each other. They're competing with each other. Uh, organizations have thousands of partners, some of them actually competitors at the same time. Some people are competitors are using the same suppliers, the same providers. So we are all one vast ecosystem. We're not, a supply chain does not end at, at a terminal point, as my colleague Helen Patton likes to say. It is a web, and we are all somewhere in the middle. The other thing is, remember that great joke about uh, the, the two hikers and the bear coming, and one of them says, oh, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. Well, the problem with that joke today is there's more than enough bear to go around. With automation and wide-scale attacks, 
You do not need to be faster than anybody else to escape being attacked. You will be attacked anyway. The question is, who wants to target you in particular? Who's opportunistic? Are you going to be caught up in a large wave of harvesting? Uh, we are operating on some very outdated models that it is uh, a, a zero-sum game and that if you win and, and make sure everybody else loses, then you're not going to be attacked. That's ridiculous. We, we can't operate like that anymore. We can't operate as every organization for itself because of breaches affect more than just the large organization. This, uh, this is a great report series from uh, Scientia and Risk Recon, um, which is um, uh, a, uh, an organization from MasterCard. The ripples across the risk surface, the, the actual ripple effects of breaches that were studied. Uh, and one, one uh, example that really got to me was the Blackbaud breach. The, ransom, uh, the Blackbaud ransomware incident. Who had heard of Blackbaud before this happened? Like one person had heard of Blackbaud before. As of last count, they're still studying and tallying up the ripple effects of that breach, but over a thousand organizations were affected. And that included a lot of nonprofits because Blackbaud is a platform for nonprofits. Nonprofits are the other critical infrastructure. When nonprofits go down, people don't get fed, there's no emergency response, people go, go unhoused. Um, everything that you can think of, they go without medical care, they're the other critical infrastructure. And if they're affected, then we are all affected. The other thing that I saw from the report was that more than one in four receivers of these ripple effects, of these sorts of breaches, ended up paying all the costs, even though it wasn't their breach. Think about that for a minute. It will end up costing organizations that maybe were already secure, but they were affected somehow by a breach in one, in one part of this ecosystem, one part of this web. So um, talking with some people about what they felt we owed one another, here's a great quote from Nicole, Nicole Perloff, who is, uh, you may know as the former New York Times journalist who wrote, this is how they tell me the world ends. She says, I not only put myself at risk, I put an ecosystem at risk. I risk becoming patient zero in an attack on my sources, on my employer, my partners, on an entire supply chain. So it's not just enough to say everybody has to take care of themselves in security. Everyone has to secure their own organization. No matter what happens, they can become, uh, they can affect other groups and not necessarily just their customers. So shared risk requires shared defenses. And as uh, U.S. National Cyber Director Chris Inglis says, the notion of a shared defense is a statement of reality, not of choice. It's already too late to deny this. It's already too late to back out. In uh, their, ex their excellent um, article in foreign, was it foreign policies, foreign affairs, sorry, I'm still a little jet lagged, uh, they wrote, a durable solution must involve moving away from the tendency to charge isolated individuals, small businesses, and local governments with shouldering absurd levels of risk. Those more capable of carrying the load, such as governments and large firms, must take on some of the burden. And collective collaborative defense needs to replace atomized and divided efforts. Until then, the problem will always look like someone else's to solve. If you take nothing else away from this talk, I think this says it all. I, I should have just asked Chris to do this talk. That probably would have been better. Now, let me talk about something I've been thinking about for a long time, the security poverty line. When I uh, first started as a CISO, I was working for a Swiss bank. Uh, I was working in uh, Zurich and in London. And I had a really big budget. 
Then I moved back home to Texas and worked for the Texas Education, Education Agency, and I had a really tiny budget. In fact, I had a zero budget. I walked in my first day on the job. I was the only security person. I had no people reporting to me, and they said, we need your budget request by the end of the day. So I sat down and wrote down about, I think I asked about, for about $2,000. I asked for a logging server and a couple of books. And the person I was reporting to scratched it out and she said, where do you think you are, the private sector? So I had zero budget and zero people when I started out. And since then, I have been very interested in the topic of how smaller organizations deal with security, and even if they can, because there are so many dynamics that come into play that create that line below which an organization cannot effectively protect itself. It's not just money. It's not just awareness. It's not just laziness. It's not just lack of prioritization, as so many people like to think. Let me talk a little bit about it. I've divided what they need up into, into four categories. There may be more. If you think of more, let me know. Um, I look at it as being money, expertise, capability, and influence. So first of all, can they actually afford the financial costs of the tools and the people? And for expertise, do they know what constitutes essential security and how to go about implementing it? And I would argue that, yes, there have been um, many you know, controls listed, lots of nice checklists created, but I would argue that we still can't just give them a very simple list. Almost 10 years ago, when I was an analyst, I did a research project asking people, asking security professionals this hypothetical. I'm a new CISO. It's my first day on the job in an organization that never, has never done security before. What should I buy? Now, you'll recognize this as my actual first day on the job at the Texas Education Agency. This actually happened. I would ask people, and they would say, oh, that's ridiculous. That would never happen. Guess what? It still happens all the time. I still have people coming to me and saying, I'm a consultant, I'm helping an organization, they haven't done security before, what should I tell them to do first? And uh, people like Nick Selby said, I hate this question and everything about it because I don't know how to answer it. Everybody said, it depends. I just asked them an open-ended question because I wanted to see how many technologies they would list. Just as a baseline, some listed four different technologies, some listed 31, and you can guess that the ones who listed 31 worked for a bank. Yeah. They could buy one of everything. So they considered everything essential. But the bottom line, when you kind of averaged everything out what people listed, it kind of matched up to PCI. Now remember, PCI is trying to manage a risk, a very scoped, well-understood risk protecting certain types of data strings. Um, but if you're just trying to say, in general, for an organization, they would say, well, it depends on the vertical, it depends on the size, it depends on how distributed they are, and, and all sorts of things. It included firewalls and AV. Remember everybody's saying that AV is dead and you know, firewalls, firewalls don't work. You can't not say firewalls. <laughs> you cannot say, no, no, you don't need to buy those. Those are fine. No, you have to buy them anyway. But I then went out with this list to vendors, and I said, I'm a 1,000-person organization. I need to buy these things. How much do they cost? And they said, well, it depends. We need to have a two-hour sales meeting with you. How about a steak? And they would not tell me, for the most part, how much it cost. Uh, only a few vendors actually had any price lists on their website. So after all of this and then figuring out, well, how many people would I really need to run each of these products and everything, fudging around, I found that I could be off by as much as a factor of four, trying to figure out, with a, sitting in front of an empty spreadsheet, going, well, I think I need one of these and I need two of those. I don't know. So there's still, after all this, there's still no guarantee that you won't get breached. 
We do not know what constitutes effective security, much less whether it's actually affordable to small organizations. I will challenge anybody who says that this is not true. Come on, I'll, I'll fight you. I'll fight you outside. So even assuming that the small enterprise, and actually this can happen to large enterprises too, that they can be below the security poverty line, assuming they know what to do, can they carry it out or are they blocked by you know, certain situations or logistics? If you don't run your own network, you can't put a firewall on it. There are all sorts of situations that constrain organizations depending on you know, what, what uh, they are what sector they're in, and what their company culture is. If you're a very web-forward organization, um, probably you won't find it difficult to buy whatever new technologies you want to try out because the idea is we're, we're bleeding to lead. We're going to do everything as hard as possible. Um, in hospitality, one of the key tenets is that you never disrupt the guest experience because Customers can leave that brand, and they may not come back for six or seven years. So you're not going to put anything in place security-wise that creates any kind of friction, which is why you don't see a whole lot of two-factor authentication yet associated with um, your customer experience in the hospitality industry. If you are a telco, any sort of security control that could potentially block traffic is anathema you're going to have a hard time pushing through something that will do that. And of course, if you're a security vendor like Cisco is, we'd better be good at it ourselves because that'll look really bad if we're not. Um, I'm sure we're going to be talking a lot this week at the conference about these dichotomies. Safety versus security and privacy versus security. Those are other big things that can hinder an organization and keep it below the security poverty line. Uh, if you are at an institute of higher education, you know that free speech, especially in the United States, is, is paramount. So you better not be blocking anybody from saying anything. Uh, you will have professors that say, this is my grant money. I'll spend it where I want. And then when they run out of grant money, then they're keeping their equipment, even though they can't afford the security for it anymore. I see Helen going, yeah, yeah. Um, all of these things. And then there's influence. Can they cause the right changes in their suppliers and their stakeholders? If you're a large company like, I don't know, American Airlines, you can say to your supplier, you need to fix this or we're going to find ourselves another supplier. And they'll do it. If you are a smaller one, let's say if you're a Texas state agency, First of all, your vendors tend to be small, um, you know, like two or three people organizations, historically underutilized businesses, um, pe uh, organizations that went bust a long time ago, uh, your brother's cousin's uncle's nephew who wrote the original software and is now living you know, in Bali or something like that. Um, or they will say to you, you're the only one who's raised this problem, so we're not going to fix it. Or they will say, we'll fix it if you pay us to fix it. So all of these things um, make it very hard in a large supply ecosystem for an organization under the security poverty line to have any effect on what it relies on. They are stuck with the level of security that vendors are willing to give to them. So let's look again at what they need, the money, the expertise, the capability, and the influence. And by expertise, again, I want to emphasize that this is not just awareness training. This is not just training in a particular product or a particular technique. It's not a CISSP. Expertise, to me, is the combination of knowledge and skills and experience so that you know what to do with something you have never seen before. Which, let's face it, is what we do every day in security, right? We are looking at something and going, well, that just happened. Okay, what do we do now? This is what is missing from these security poor organizations. Even if we give them a CISSP each for free, 
that is not going to replace or give them the expertise that they need to handle something. Which, by the way, when uh, the war broke out in Ukraine, which is why Cisco not only sent out um, endpoint software to organizations in Ukraine, I think we're covering about 19,000 endpoints right now, but our own people are running those endpoint software products and are doing the threat hunting. So we are also giving our expertise to them, not just throwing a product over and saying, good luck, let us know how it goes. Here's another great quote from Sarah Krisha. I don't know if you know her, but she is a freelance uh, journalist who covers cybersecurity out of Austria. In 1989, two things happened within weeks of each other. The Berlin Wall fell, and Tim Berners-Lee created the World Wide Web. This started the vision of a global world where we would all come together. But now it's the internet of many in the hands of a few. If we want to return to a democratic state, we need to get it back to societal common ground. So that's the other dynamic that we have to face and have to work with, that it is not as democratic as, and as, sorry, as democratic an internet as we need it to be if we are all to come together to work on securing it. So let's start with the fundamentals. What should we be doing? We need to address the money problem, that's, that's true. But again, it's not just a matter of pipeline, it's not just a matter of, we're gonna train 5,000 new cyber people. Again, it's not just training, it's expertise, it's experience, it's lived uh, it's knowledge gained by living through it, by practicing. So we need expertise, not awareness, and we need, we need to migrate from legacy environments wherever we can. And uh, I know that the G7 yesterday just announced a new initiative um, t uh, in, in terms of infrastructure. A lot of this is very, uh, is very needed. Uh, it's building up capabilities for um, uh, manufacturing vaccine, for example, in poorer countries, uh, up upgrading um, telecommunications and things like that. That sort of infrastructure is really important, but it stops short of the actual cyber part. Now, when uh, we did some research over the last couple of years together with the Scientia Institute, uh, which was also founded by some folks who founded the, the Verizon DBIR. And we wanted to look at security outcomes, not just what people were doing in security, but what actually works. And uh, you can read those reports for free if you want to look at them. Uh, we looked at 25 different security practices and then looked to see if there was any statistical correlation with 11 security outcomes not just not getting hacked, but also you know, keeping up with the business, minimizing unplanned work, recruiting and retaining talent, uh, meeting com compliance requirements, you know, those sorts of things. And one of the top things that we found, and I swear I did not do this myself, the top, one of the top practices that we found was having a proactive tech refresh practice. That affected statistically the security outcomes across the board. Everything from recruiting and retaining talent, which makes sense because you know, nobody wants to be a DB2 admin for their entire career. Um, but also uh, everything, making it easier to keep up with what the business wants, refreshing that technology. Then we looked last year at, well, okay, refreshing technology, what does that mean? Does that mean refreshing IT? Does that mean refreshing security? How often? Who does it? How does it work the best? And we did find that in general, if you have a modernized infrastructure that is cloud-based and that is centralized, you have statistically the best chance of reporting good security outcomes and a good security refresh practice. So putting all those things together, if we can help modernize legacy infrastructure that security poor organizations are dealing with, 
hopefully we will set them up for more success and security. But that's, as you can see, that's, uh, that it's not a direct express lane. It's going to take a long time, starting with uh, migrating from legacy environments. I've tried to migrate into the cloud. It didn't go well. So I, I'm, I'm not saying this blithely, I'm, I'm, but I am saying that as far as we can tell with the data that we have, it is necessary. So what do we owe these organizations? Here are some questions that I've been thinking about for security costs and spending. What, what would we owe them? Is there a minimum amount that everybody needs to spend on security? Do we know what it is? And what if they can't spend it? There are uh, verticals that only have about 1% profit margin, like retail, like the, the little um, corner shops, as opposed to technology, which last I looked had a, an average margin of 12%. They can spend a lot more on IT and then, therefore on security than uh, other verticals can. And you know in the healthcare sector, if they have any money left over, they're going to get another nurse or another doctor. They are not going to spend it on more and fancier IT. Also, open source is not the answer. I'm sorry. Love open source, but it's not free if you need people to run it. Now, this can be a lot cheaper where labor is cheaper. Uh, skilled labor is cheaper, for example, in South America. Um, they, you see a lot more usage of open source software because IT professionals uh, are a lot easier to come by there. Should we provide some basic security infrastructure or controls or create a subsidized service? Now we're starting to get here into issues of whether the government should be doing this. And I know in the United States, we don't trust our government at all, as far as we can throw them, which is not very far. Um, but that doesn't have to be that way. Uh, look at Estonia. Uh, when, when the citizenry has a much better, more trusting relationship with its government, that opens up a lot more possibilities to have centralized security that not every business or every organization has to pay for itself. And furthermore, what security should be built in? Now I'm talking with, as a vendor to all other vendors out here, what should we be building in and therefore it should be available at no extra charge? You hear about the SSO tax that um, Bob Rudis talks about, that um, single sign-on costs extra, and it really shouldn't. There are other things that, uh, different levels of logging, different types of functionality that ideally should be available to everyone without having to buy the platinum premium edition of something? Um, is there a base level of incident response functionality that all vendors should be making affordable, should be making available at no extra charge, or available for free? That's the other question, too. What do we owe other organizations? What do we owe one another in terms of our expertise? And again, it's not just, it's great when everybody teaches classes. That's wonderful. It's very nice. If you can't afford to go, it doesn't help. Um, most of the people who attend conferences like these, you know, get, have it paid for. What do we do with those who are not IT people, but who are somehow in charge of IT at their organization? How do we help them? How do we go to where they are? Do we create a kind of a cyber peace corps where people volunteer to do, um, to do service in a cybersecurity capacity? That's something we can think about. Uh, things like, well, here at these conferences, we will always talk about sharing more information, sharing more information. I helped to stand up the retail ISAC, so I know just how difficult it is to actually share the right type of information with the right people at the right time, at the right level of detail. Um, but things like the National Transportation Safety Board idea for cyber, which I think has launched, it's launched, right? That should help us 
take some things that up until now have been just within our circles and make them more publicly available to people who need to hear them even if they don't know it. Um, security products, I think, should be required, it uh, should be designed to require less arcane security expertise. And I know this really hurts engineers who have spent years building really fancy consoles. But I can tell you that the average IT admin is not going to sit there and admire your console. They're not going to sit there and click everything to see what it does. They have a job to do. You are just one of many consoles. They want to get in. They want to solve whatever problem it is. And they want to get back out again. So can we design better security products that don't require the love and caring and admiration and geekery that we are all used to. Um, visibility and transparency are great, but you have to know what to do about it. So just information sharing is not enough. Uh, again, it's, it, it's great, but it is not sufficient. We do need a bigger pipeline. We need to support all paths into security. I myself am a liberal arts dropout. Uh, and I only got into security because I had studied languages and I ended up working in Switzerland. So there you have it. Um, now, the, the other really controversial thing that I want to lay in front of you is um, for the last 10 years at least, the cybersecurity expertise has been going to the highest bidder, which tends to be security vendors or very, very large organizations like banks who can afford them. Um, I don't know what the latest uh, DFIR top salary is, but last I heard it was $500,000 base salary. Nobody, nobody can afford that except the very few. We have to move this expertise out of the hands of the very few into the many. I don't know how we're going to do that, but um, I'm raising it here. Oh, thank you, Trey. <laughs> Capability. This is the hardest one to help with. This is really difficult because it has everything to do with company culture, with technology environment, with physical environment, with um, everything else that affects the business of an organization. But can we create architecture standards to create better outcomes for cybersecurity? Can we enable better tech refresh and integration practices? We're starting to learn with our research about what facilitates better integration. I learned another really interesting thing uh, leading a workshop last week in London at InfoSec where we were talking about how to create OKRs and action items for and metrics for these things that came out of our security outcome study. And I was talking about integration. And the three choices we had given the companies that we surveyed were out-of-the-box integration, um, using a preferred vendor that had pre-integrated you know, everything in a platform approach, and DIY integration. And one person raised their hand and said that was a, a false choice, that as an MSSP, they were never happy with any kind of integration, no matter how they got to it. They always had to add some DIY on top. So again, it depends on what your standards are for, for integration. Uh, you may always have to be adding things on top of it. And again, this is something that security poor organizations are not set up to do. They will take whatever integration comes ideally from a preferred vendor, maybe out of the box, but if they get out of the box, they often don't get around to it <laughs> unless it's already done because they have plenty of other things they have to deal with. Uh, so how can we create better integration outcomes, better tech refresh outcomes with security standards in an affordable way? Can we move non-core business functions to the cloud? We already have that, for the most part, with email. There's only so much differentiation you can do with email. You, you know, and, and things are consolidating on certain providers. Um, payroll has been outsourced and effectively in the cloud for one decade, two decades, I don't know, hard to say. 
but we hardly ever think about it, but it's a non-core business function. What else could we help organizations move? Um, can we make vertical specific reference architectures? Not compliance checklists, but actually this is what tends to work for healthcare. This is what tends to work best for post offices. Um, whatever, can we build more of those? There's some efforts to do that right now, but we could sure use a lot more. And it's a lot easier for those in a very constricted environment uh, where, let's say, vendors don't typically build integrations for their types of software to be able to find out. that This is where the role of system integrators, I think, deserves more attention. Uh, where can we work more with system integrators to bring more security functionality? Because that's where those companies are going to go. And is there a shared responsibility model that we can actually agree on? Can we agree on one? Mm -mm. I'm seeing a no. Anybody disagree? Yeah, I think you're about to propose one. Uh, no, actually, I am not about to propose one because everyone has a shared responsibility model until they get punched in the logs. Um, this is something that I always had to struggle with as a CISO, just the idea of, well, you should have been keeping better logs. You should have been logging at a deeper level. Nobody will turn on debug level logging unless you're pretty sure there's already an incident, and by then it's too late. So what do we owe? What should we be providing by default? What is the best level to have for all eventualities? I don't know if we can, if we can do that, but uh, we really do have to get better at the shared responsibility model because that's often just a proxy for saying, yeah, you should, we thought you were doing that. Or we're sorry, you know, that's going to be extra if you want us to do that. We're going to have to, you're going to have to pay us more. Finally, what do we owe each other in terms of influence? I think this is some place where we can help more for those companies under the security poverty line. Whether you're a CISO at one of those organizations who cannot convince their management to give them any more budget to do something, or whether you are a group of organizations in a specific vertical who can come together and maybe wield more power as a group. The ISACs are pretty good for this, but not everybody can afford to join an ISAC. Is there a way that larger organizations that have more weight can throw that weight around to benefit not necessarily just customers, but you know, the community at large, everybody? Not just donating, but actually putting skin in the game, putting things on the line to use the influence, maybe the outsized influence that they have today to say, we need to build this, we need to make this easier. For organizations. And we, th there was some discussion about how to identify a linchpin in the organization. Remember, nobody had heard of BlackBaud until it was attacked by ransomware and then a thousand organizations were affected by it. So we don't necessarily know where the linchpin organizations are. We don't know who's going to take everybody else down. I mean, sure, we know the biggest and obvious ones. Uh, especially the cloud providers, but we don't know everybody in the supply ecosystem. It really depends on the, the failure mode that they go through and how that cascades. So we need to figure out what linchpin organizations are as part of our ecosystem, especially for security purposes, and let them know, hey, did you know we're all depending on you, and this is the sort of support that we expect from you. We need to balance risk-driven regulation between the biggest and the loudest organizations and the rest of the community. You'll notice that we always invite banks to come speak at cybersecurity conferences. We invite the, you know, the biggest names, even if they're not that big, if we know who they are, if we know, you know they're a cool high-tech name, we invite them. We need to invite the voices of those who are not as sexy or not as high tech, not as cool, because they have valuable things to say about the difficulties of achieving cybersecurity. Um, 
this I'm speaking now to conference organizers. We really need to bring in more diversity, and I don't necessarily mean color of skin or gender identity or anything like that, but where they come from, what kind of business they're doing, and what they're struggling with. We need to bring those, those voices in because it's usually the larger ones that can afford to lobby for legislation to fix what they, you know, what they think it should be. Um, I mean, I can tell you that having studied a lot of smaller retailers, when it comes to PCI DSS, a lot of the, the level three or level two just don't bother trying to meet the compliance requirements. They just hope they won't get caught. So the regulation wasn't really for them. It was, you know, for the large companies. Am I sounding like a socialist right now? Not Maybe? No, no, I'll, I'll keep working on it. Thank you. Um, and the whole cross-border military versus civil cybersecurity policy problem. Um, we still tend to gravitate too much either towards the military side and OMG, ATP, APT, LMNOP, fancy animals thing versus the sorts of security problems that smaller organizations are having every day. They're not that exciting. The Texas Department of Insurance is probably not dealing with any threat actor that has a fancy name. So we need to pay more attention to those and also uh, work cross-border with one another. And again, it's, this is not just a nice to have. We have to do this. We are all being affected by cybersecurity breaches that cross borders already. Uh, we just have to recognize it and realize that we need to work together. This isn't just a matter of boosting our trade at the expense of another country's trade agenda. This is not just uh, necessarily just a case of um, cybersecurity offensive teams versus one another. This is not, you know, playing the cool games. This is, you know, the cool reindeer games where everybody's doing CTFs together. That's great. But we have to bring it down to the level of the population, the small businesses, the consumers, the citizens. One more quote from Professor Martin, who I sure wish were here today. Sure miss you. Um, I think we need to think about cyberspace as an environment where we increasingly live and work. So that means we have obligations to each other. We have obligations to look after our bit of the digital environment. We have the obligation not to be digital pollutants. That's something we haven't even talked about yet in this talk. We have the obligation not to allow bad things to happen on our patch. Again, that's great. But I think we lean too much on that and say, well, you should have been secure. You should have secured your infrastructure. What if they can't? This is what this whole talk is about. What if they can't? What do we owe in terms of help? Because we are being affected by all of it. We have the obligation to work in our personal and professional lives to help clean up the digital environment. So bringing this round, this may be as complicated as battling climate change. I believe it is. But I believe at the end of the day, it is every bit as critical. It has every bit uh, as great a possibility of leaking into our actual physical lives, affecting lives, affecting health care. Um, everything that we care about that we have learned in the last few years to protect one another and to protect ourselves as a group applies equally in the cybersecurity realm. It is a pragmatic as well as a moral imperative. I believe it is our civic duty to be working on helping one another and coming together. We can do more, and I believe we will do more, so we should be doing more of this together. I'm ready for your arguments now. If there are questions, I see two microphones out there, or if you just want to yell.
Well, thanks. Hello? Oh. Yes, hello. Go ahead. There are four microphones here, actually, in the back. Kato Hopio from Enisa. I, I really liked your thought of NTSB of cyberspace. And actually, that, that actually brings back uh, an interesting question of how security is considered in aviation. Mm -hmm. And how reporting on security incidents is considered to be a norm, not an exception. Uh, I mean, it's, it's really to report a security incident so that the organization can learn, not to find, not to find the, the culprits to, to who, who, who did wrong, but to, to how the organization can learn about the security situation uh, uh, so that it, the incident doesn't happen again. We should really consider cybersecurity incidents as something in a similar fashion. We should really be more open. Uh, I agree with you. And in, in the aviation incidents, we understand very well now that it is a collection of different circumstances and particular choices and, and, and actions that lead to a chain that leads to the incident. Uh, we can do this, too, in uh, security. But the problem is that I find when we compare it with aviation, that it turns out that the toddler in seat 21C actually did something, you know, that because it's not just the pilot flying the plane in cybersecurity. If it were, if we just had one trained professional flying the whole thing, we probably wouldn't have the problems that we do. So I think there's a lot more, or, or they changed, uh, you know, one of the wings in mid-flight and that created the problem. Or, um, you know, this is a really, really old plane, it's a legacy plane, uh, yes, mainframes, uh, le legacy mainframe was still flying fine until it wasn't, and, and things like that. So uh, I think the analogy breaks down somewhat, but I agree with you that we should be able to um, analyze as much as we can and share that information about security incidents. The problem is that some of the aspects of the security incident are so close to the business, so close to um, aspects of the business that can only be revealed in the case of a public company very, very carefully so as not to disrupt markets or, you know, that they consider to be a competitive advantage. And it's really hard to peel apart the security from the business. What, what, one additional comment here is, is that some areas uh, have actually mandatory reporting even on cybersecurity incidents nowadays. Mm -hmm. This should be really considered by the party receiving these mandatory reports as to not to punish, but to how I can help you. Yes. How I can help you to alleviate the situation you have reported now. Yes. We as C certs, uh, we as national C certs, we should really have this, how I can help you. How can I help you? you? Yes, that's a, that's a very good, that's a very good uh, attitude that we should encourage. Trey. Is this on? Uh, yeah. So to, I want to just echo a little bit, add a little bit on this aviation theme, and then I have one of those infamous, not a question, but a comment. Uh, uh, so sit down. In, in my pilot training, one of the things that I learned was like the vast majority of air accidents, the root cause outcome is determined to be human error. Mm -hmm. And when you sit in a cockpit, whether it's a small plane or a big, you know, trans-oceanic jet, you're looking at an array, quite like, you know, a lot of the dashboards that vendors like to build into their tools. The position of each and every instrument, every switch, every safety cover, every secondary backup system, there's a human death associated with that. And sure, in the post-mortem of an accident, a particular individual may have been found to be at fault, but the difference in that more mature industry is that the vendors who make the tools go back and adapt the tools to make them fail safe in that failure mode. And as an industry, security tools are insecure, they're hostile, they often ship with default configurations that are dangerous out of the box. And here I come to my comment, which is this. The, the, the halting problem is still an open question, right? What is the halting problem? It's basically like, here's some random program. Can you programmatically determine whether it will stop? 
or go into an infinite loop, right? Like, is this binary malicious? Is a subset of that problem I would submit to you? I don't think we're gonna maybe be alive when this is solved definitively for the mathematicians, but if I was a betting man, I would say that it's not gonna be solved probably in our lifetime, maybe a few generations, maybe ever. If we said, though, let us work as though to cure the patient and not as though we were rent seekers. <laughs> I wonder how that would transform this ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, good point. Very good point, thank you. Uh, Aaron, is this on here? Yeah, Aaron Captain here, uh, actually uh, I had a uh, an idea that I uh, you know, wanted to bring back about the pollution. The pollution uh, concept really rang a bell with me. Yeah. But Trey just gave me that, uh, the tennis ball to uh, continue. So the halting problem is unsolvable, undecidable, right? So yeah, there you go. Um, so, you know, so is it secure is, I would argue, also argue, is a sub problem of that. So, um, and I would say the pollution part of that, which rang in your talk, rang a bell with me, is Basically, um, the question like, you know, was that code mathematically so sound that it actually, you know, is, is provably correct, right? <laughs> Hard problem, right? Um, related with theoretical computer science holding, et cetera. Um, so the pollution part is like, did the other programmer or a developer or a vendor create a, a clean system? And not only that, um, um, the difference where I think it breaks down to aviation is uh, nature doesn't intentionally attack us, and currently at least, yeah, I mean, maybe cli us. climate change yeah. might, yeah, <laughs> but there's no real, you know, human with that intention behind it, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in our world, there is. So th this is the difference in the, in, the, in, the, in the risk modeling that you have to take into account, because the attacker will adjust Right, the sentient yeah. ad adversary. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So I, I prefer the model of <clears throat> um, pollution is the unsafe software, and um, the, the let's help each other part is actually the way to clean up the pollution. And I think if, you, if we manage to, to strengthen that concept and bring it out to those who are not here in the conference and include them, as you said, as much as possible, um, then this sets a role model, and this is where we're good at humans, uh, like to, to, you know, bring people to the same actions eventually. <laughs> it takes a lot of efforts, but I think this is how we need to address this, so maybe yeah. a comment on your... Yeah, yeah good Thank thoughts. You. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. So, you or me? Uh, okay, me. Uh, excuse <laughs> me, uh, can, can, oh. I've been waiting a little bit. Someone else? Over here. All right. All right. Yeah. Oh, I, I, okay. I think your uh, budget cybersecurity is a problem is a little bit bigger than you let out to be because it's actually more the whole organization. I'm in healthcare research, and we have in investigators who are using two million dollar mass spectrometers or on uh, microscopes yeah. that are running on Windows XP and other embedded yes. systems. Because it works fine, doesn't it? Yeah, it works fine. And, uh, and they don't have the budget to take out their important research to buy a brand new system. So we have to figure out ways to make these, make it easier for these small companies that do not have the expertise to constantly in update their uh, operating systems or even build security into their systems. Right, and, and when our, when our um, research discovered that having proactive tech refresh strategies resulted in better security outcomes, my first thought was, well, what about the ones that can't refresh? What, what they simply can't, like you were talking about with Windows XP. It's one of the most stable functional operating systems out there. Why would you change that? It, it can be prohibitively expensive to roll trucks to all the millions of kiosks still running XP. Um, what about the, the multi-million dollar CT scanners that literally cannot hold any more patches? 
not even to update the operating system, much less security patches. It's a huge problem, and you're right, that's, that's an aspect of it. I think we owe it to our critical organizations like healthcare research to be able to go back and not tell them, well, you should just update, because you can't. Thank you. You, um, you mentioned that uh, open source software is costly to run, uh, so it's commercial products, but what would be um, needed from the open source community to lower the cost of all these tools? What is your um, opinion or advice on, on that? Oh boy, that could be a whole other talk, couldn't it? <laughs> um, just off the top of my head, I would, I would say um, better design that is not for by engineers for engineers, that it should. You mean, uh, um, better uh, user interface and, and all that. Yeah, uh, better design, user interface, and everything that takes into account um, different personas of different users. Um, also, um, the problem we always have is more reliable uh, support and better open source. Uh, well, S bombs are going to help some. But most organizations still don't know what they're going to do with an SBOM anyway. So that's packaging those things up into is, so that anyone can figure out, is this good open source software for me to use? How will I know when it needs updating? If it does need fixing, who do I go to? And who can I rely on to fix it if I can't fix it myself? And again, bundling that all in a much more um, consumer friendly um, support system. But that's, that's just off the top of my head, and I'm sure you have some thoughts as well. Yep. Th thank you for, um, for the input. And, uh, I think that the open source community will try to uh, uh, lower the cost of running all software for everyone. Yeah. Thank you. So, so it's funny that you mentioned SBOM because Alan Friedman is here, and, and that brings to mind that this is a big honking problem that you're, you're pointing out to us. But the thing I want to observe is that five years ago, I, I amongst others, was saying SBOM's an impossibility. We can't get there. Uh -huh. But the reality is we can. And that's something that people need to also take from your talk, that it's not just about what the problem is. It's how do we get to that solution, and it can be solved, maybe not in a whole, but unless we start working on it and, and taking some of the ideas that you're putting forth, we're never going to solve it. And that's something that we really need to acknowledge. Yeah, that's right. And it, and it goes from a, well, this would be really cool to do, to I have a personal sense of obligation to do this, not because it is going to get me more customers, but because it's better for all of us. And then maybe even to the point where in... Uh, in countries where uh, such a thing can safely be done to say, look, you know, we have to pull together, we're going to require everybody to do this. Um, yeah, that may not be the United States, but I'm hoping somebody will step forward and lead. Ireland, here you go. You can do this. Okay. So you talked about a lot of things that we could do um, that large organizations or more experienced people could do to help victims can we also help address the issue by doing things towards the adversaries, the way large companies, say, <coughs> prosecute limited resources and such? And so what can we do towards the adversaries, not just what can we do for the victims? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And one of the things that I really liked that came out of the ransomware task force report last year was there was just as much emphasis on what do we do about the adversaries, not just how do we get a bigger stick to beat the victims? <clears throat> so, um, and, and I just joined the steering committee for that task force, so we are hoping to find more ways to help both from a defense side and from an actual prosecution side. Yeah, it, this is a multifaceted problem. It's, it's just as complex as climate change, I think. And there are just as many human foibles that are uh, that we have to tackle in order to tackle the actual problem. Um, but I'd like, I, I would hope that everyone would come away with this thinking, okay, you know, it's, it's time for us to step in, up and say, we have responsibilities beyond 
our particular jobs at this point in time. Anything no else? No more questions? I have one more question for you, yeah. Wendy. Thanks a lot for the amazing talk. If you had one wish to first, what should first be doing? Remember we have this tagline, improving security together? Yeah. What should first be doing? Oh, boy. You know, uh, this is my first time attending first, so I would not presume. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I would not presume to make suggestions because there are so many smart people in here who are already discussing things. Um, but certainly, uh, anything you can do to help bring more people in from more countries um, to talk about not just the victories, but the challenges in a safe environment like this one, I think would be great. Thank you very much. I think yeah. we accept that challenge. Thank you, everybody. Um. Thank you, no introduction is complete here at a first conference without the capture the flag. David, may I ask you to show us the state of things? Is there a way to, oh yeah. the red cable. Okay, so we'll just do a quick update on CTF. Uh, I will just first show who is actually behind because I think we did not really introduce who was preparing the CTF this year. So as you can see, there were a few changes. So this year, so third BR, CSI, um, Netcout, and, uh, and my team are actually quite long participants. And we also got the sponsoring from first for uh, a few years, so thanks for it. Uh, this year, we're also receiving help from CTU and Enviso. So thanks to, to all of those that help preparing that CTF. We have started in September, and I hope you will enjoy. Uh, in terms of scoring, as you can see, we opened the CTF yesterday at 12, lunchtime. It was 12 sharp. A few minutes later, some teams started to submitting the first flags, and it was a heavy and intense day yesterday. Uh, from the score, we can see that we have a few teams, three actually, that managed to get all the flags right yesterday, uh, that are now competing for the, the prizes. All the teams are actually very, very close. And even if you start today, you still have a chance to reach to the top. So I would suggest that if you did not start the CTF yet, you can still do. Uh, at 9 today, a bit later actually, uh, we have released a new batch of challenges. So there are no more to play with. And we'll continue to release new challenges tomorrow and on Thursday as well. Uh, we still have a few, actually a hundred of those coins that we printed for Edinburgh first conference, so our plan is to give those that remains to the one that deserve one. Uh, a few, the first team was awarded the con. We will do a special challenge for that today or in the coming day as well. So have a look on it, it's just for fun, and it might be a nice collector for you to, to get. And uh, just as the last statistics, so for now we have 146 users split into 65 teams that are participating and that are very, very close. So there are more teams uh, to create. There are still rooms in the team. As you can see, it's an average of two players per team. We accept up to four. So feel free to team up with others. Feel free to create your team and feel free to join. And that's all for me. Thanks for your time. So that brings us to the end of the first part of the second day. I do hope you enjoyed this. I did very much so. And uh, talk to you in the hallway over a coffee. Enjoy the day. Thanks a lot.